First, thanks very much for having me. Uh, always a pleasure to speak about the SQL. It's uh, my favorite language. Uh, incidentally, anyone knows what was uh, chosen as the most popular programming language in uh, 2013, and not just for databases. Generally, there is a Tayuba uh, index that uh, goes does the statistics. So, any clue? T-SQL, right? So T-SQL is, is, I was surprised. First, I thought it was a joke, and I went and checked on those that do those uh, statistics, and they did write in uh, an article uh, that, uh, uh, well, not much was going on with any other language, so this could explain some of it, but, you know, still, to have uh, T-SQL being the most popular language across the board is quite uh, amazing. So, since it's my native tongue, I, I was very uh, proud. Um, <laughs> And I was also very happy when I got in uh, to see that uh, you serve beer for the attendees. Uh, but then I discovered that it's a non-alcoholic beer. So <laughs> no alcohol, I'm saying no slides. I'll do just a management studio, right? <laughs> so uh, how many people here are using already the apply operator, cross apply, outer apply in your code? All right, so it's a good uh, percentage, I see. I have to say in most of the cases where I do this kind of survey, uh, I get well under half, you know, that say we actually use it and know about it and so on. And it seems strange that uh, uh, this feature seems to be kind of under the radar for many people. And it was added already in SQL Server 2005, very, very powerful tool. And uh, there are some kind of, uh, let's say, typical uh, use cases and optimization aspects, but then there are the more uh, creative ones. And uh, this is what I wanted to uh, have as the focus of our session. So since it seems like at least 80% here already use it, then I'll do a very, very short part just describing it for the sake of those who don't know it yet, but then most of the time we'll spend on uh, those more uh, creative features. So um, the apply operator is a, an operator that in some sense resembles a cross-join. And that's why one of the versions of apply is called cross-apply. But then there is something that cross-join simply doesn't know how to do, and apply kind of adds this logic. So let's take as an example, I have some kind of a query, select a from some table T1, and then I want to go and return, or maybe let's take a table that I really have in the database, so sales.customers, uh, uh, let's say, and I have, uh, let's name it in short, C, and I have uh, some customer ID and some company name, and at the moment something like 91 uh, rows in the table. And now if I wanted to go and take another table and match to each row from one side, all rows from the other side, naturally we would use a cross join for this. So here I would say cross join, and then the right side would be some sort of a table, let's say hr.employees as E, and then if I wanted to collect from E the employee ID and anything else, now we have 91 rows in one side, we have nine rows in the other side, and then as you can see we have 819 rows returned in the result is just a very basic Cartesian product, right? Uh, thing is, what if I have not a table, but a table expression? So, you know, in this case, it could be a derived table, table function that returns, you know, a table result. And I need to construct the result set based on elements that I'm collecting from the left side. So, with the cross join, the two relations, you know, SQL gives us tables representing relations from the relational model. The two relations in the cross join have to be sort of static, uh, predefined relations, meaning that both sides are evaluated before the table operator operates on them, right? In a cross apply, we have an extra capability. The left side is still a static, predefined relation. The right side is evaluated per row from the left side, and in fact can be constructed based on elements that we collect from the left side. So, for example, here I can have a query, uh, never mind from what, 
from any kind of table, let's say some T1 table, but then I can have something very, very similar to a correlation in a correlated subquery. So I could say here, T1 dot something, let's say column one is equal to, and then refer to the left side, in our case it's a table called C, and then equals to, you know, something from that left side. And then I can go and return elements from the left side. So what's the difference here from a normal correlated subquery that we know? Before the apply was introduced, you could only use scalar and multi-valued correlated subqueries. Yeah? You couldn't uh, perform some kind of a table-valued correlated subquery in a sense. So now the way we should uh, try to visualize this is as if we're looking at the rows from the left side, and for each of those rows, the right side goes and is evaluated based on references to the elements from the left row. That's what's unique here. So, I mean, technically, uh, I mean, if I try to run this, it will fail because I have the correlation and I'm trying to use a cross join. But then, if I go and say cross apply, that's exactly what this operator knows to do that the join doesn't know, you know, to do. So, the right side could be a table expression with correlations. It could even be a table function. Maybe I have a table function that accepts as inputs elements that I'm collecting from the left row, you know. So it doesn't have to be the table expression directly, it could be a table function that returns a table, but the elements that we pass from the left side are similar to the correlations, right? That's in kind of, I don't know, two minutes what the uh, cross apply is, right? So with this in mind, let's go straight to the more kind of creative, more advanced and interesting uh, use cases. Um, uh, maybe just a word before we continue. You know that generally Microsoft prefers uh, to implement features based on standard SQL. So, you know, it's already well designed. It's been through all those committees that discuss all the small, uh, you know, design aspects. And, you know, it's, it's so much easier if Microsoft doesn't need to go through all the normal design phases for the logical side of things. But as it turns out, when they wanted to introduce this feature into the product, they didn't realize that uh, it, there's already a standard feature. Anyone here uh, reads standard SQL? You know, looking at ISO or ANSI SQL? So I do this almost every day, uh, just to check different aspects of language features. And if you ever tried, the standard can be quite dense. So let me just go and open a, the latest standard. So looking at ISO SQL 2011, that's the latest one that is out, and here is just the second document. That's the one that deals with only the fundamental language features. Uh, you see the number of pages here? It's 1472, and it's very, very dense language. So you will see here lots of kind of acronyms that point to other sections in the document that then use a whole bunch of other acronyms that then point to other sections in the document. And unless you know how what you're looking for is called, it's not always that straightforward to go and find it. So if you're looking for, you know, uh, something called the join, it's quite easy, you know. But uh, if you didn't know how the feature was called, and maybe there is such a feature, yeah, there are some sections, a section dealing with data manipulation and other sections, so you know roughly where, but let's say it's not a surprise if it exists and you didn't find it. So. Anyone knows how the feature is called in the standard, a similar feature? It's called lateral, or lateral correlation, right? So this is the feature, lateral derived table. And basically the way it's defined by standard SQL is very similar to what I said before. We need kind of a cross join that in the query that we activate, the inner query has a correlation. So basically you're supposed to say cross join and then lateral, and now what comes here is a derived table, right? But within it, what we apply, basically, is a query that has a reference, what normally, you know, the cross join doesn't allow us to do with the lateral derived table we are allowed to do. Anyway, that ship has sailed already. Microsoft already went and added the cross apply and outer apply operator, so it's not a simple thing for them to now go back 
and switch to the standard syntax. So just be aware that if you're looking for the feature in other platforms, or if you're migrating from Oracle to SQL Server and you already use Lateral there, you want to change it to the apply operator, right? So just, just a small thing about the connection to the standard, right? Now let's go ahead and start looking at uh, more creative use cases. Uh, one of the things people keep uh, uh, stumbling into in terms of traps, there are many, many traps in the language, is the most basic attempt to sort of reuse column aliases that we define in our query. So, you know, let's take an example. I'm querying, a, let's say, this a orders table. Right, and what I want to do, I want to go and perform some sort of a computation. Like, I go and apply the year of order date computation and creating a column called order year. Right, nothing too special. Then, I want to go and use this alias, maybe in my where clause, maybe in my group by clause, you know, somewhere else in the query. And then I'm trying this most basic attempt, or the year, maybe needs to be greater than 2006. And then when I try to run it, I'm getting an error. So any suggestions why this error? Exactly. So there is something very interesting about the design of SQL, the logical design, where we type the clauses in the query, select from where group by having and then order by. But in terms of the logical interpretation of the elements, SQL is designed uh, to evaluate them differently, not in the order in which we type them. There's a reason behind this. Originally, the designers of the language we wanted to create a language that is one, declarative, so we declare our intention as opposed to providing instructions of how we want things to get done. And the second thing is they wanted the language to resemble English. In fact, this was the original name of the language, not SQL. That's how the language was initially created. And back then, the term was an acronym for structured, and then the next is English, and then query, and then language. But then there was a trademark dispute with an airline company that already held a trademark on this name, so they couldn't keep it, and then they had to change it, and they changed it to what we know now, SQL. But anyway, the point about the, the design of the language uh, being an English-like language, how we make instructions. So when we make instructions, we typically don't start with a location, but rather with the object that we want to obtain. So if I say, give me the book from the office, you notice I started with the object and only later talked about the location. But if we wanted to write somehow instructions to, uh, let's say, a very dumb robot that doesn't have uh, very sophisticated language intelligence, you would produce instructions that say, go to the room, pick up the book, bring it to me, you know, something like this. Now, in a very similar manner, we type, select with the columns that we want before we indicate the source tables and then the filtering and so on. But the logical interpretation works differently, more like the instructions that we need to give to this dumb robot. We start with the from clause. That's the very, very first major clause that is logically interpreted, and then we proceed to filtering, then we proceed to grouping, then we proceed to filtering groups, and only then we get to the select part. Afterwards, we deal with any presentation ordering element. So whatever you define within the select, naturally, is not visible in any uh, uh, previous phase, let's say. Now, this explains why we couldn't do this. By the way, it's, it's amazing how many people don't realize this and actually really think it's some kind of a buggy behavior in the product. In one session, someone came to me at the end and asked me, when is Microsoft going to fix this uh, bug? So, of course, not a bug that's completely by design and not Microsoft who chose this. This is how it's defined by standard SQL. Now, something interesting is that we can't even do things like, uh, let's say, if I wanted to refer to this alias, not here, but rather here, and I said, order year plus one as next year, right? Even this isn't allowed, but this 
restriction actually is not related to the logical processing order, rather the fact that our language is based on the relational model, which is then based on a set theory and predicate logic. And the, the relation, what we uh, uh, get as a table in SQL, has a header and a body. The header is a set of attributes, or what SQL calls rows, and the body is a set of tuples, or what SQL calls, uh, or sorry, the, the header is a set of attributes, what SQL calls columns, of course, and the body is a set of tuples, what SQL calls rows. And one of the most fundamental properties of a set is it has no order. In mathematical set theory, a set is supposed to be treated as a whole. We are not supposed to uh, deal with its individual elements. That's the reason why there's no order. We don't think of the elements in order, we think of them in an all-at-once manner, as a single uh, entity. And based on this idea, the set of expressions that we have in the select is supposed to be treated as a whole in an all-at-once manner. So there's no relevance here to left-to-right order like in most programming languages. So in most programming languages, when you define a certain computation and store it somewhere, it's immediately visible to the subsequent computation, not in SQL. Only subsequent phases in the logical processing flow will be able to see what previous phases generated, but not the same phase, because of this set sort of treatment. Right? So this explains to you uh, why even this attempt isn't allowed. So what's the only clause where we should be able to see aliases that we defined in the select? Or the by. That's the only one. Now, how most people deal with this problem, most people use some series of CTEs or derived tables, where we go ahead and define, let's say, a CTE based on this query, and then the outer query queries the CTE and refers to that alias. But what if then I need to create another computation based on the previous one, there will be another CTE, and very quickly our code gets you know, very complex. So uh, every question I'm about to ask you next, the answer is apply. Remember this. So uh, what do we do to solve this? Apply. Apply is our solution. This was quick. You didn't expect it so quickly, I know. So here's the thing, cross apply, is a table operator, right? So if I'm applying something, let's say I want to call this A1 because it's my first applied table expression, anything that is defined by a table operator in the logical processing flow is going to be visible automatically to all subsequent phases. Not the same phase, but any subsequent phases. And because from is our first entry point in the logical processing flow, whatever we create here, is naturally visible to the where, to the group by, and so forth, even to other table operators, by the way, because each table operator starts a new kind of series of logical phases. So I could take this nice feature that we get in 2008, the values clause, uh, that before 2008 was only available in insert statements, but in 2008 allows us to go and define rows for a derived table. I mean, after all, values defines a set of rows, right? And a table is a set of rows. So why not allow us to define a derived table based on a values clause so we can use this form? So we are defining a derived table called A1 based on a set of rows that we define using a values clause. If we want only one row, there will be only one pair of parentheses. If we want multiple rows, there will be a comma, another pair, and so on. I don't have any prizes to give, but anyone knows, and the answer is not apply, by the way. So anyone knows how many, at most, we can define in a values clause? Thousand. Excellent. I wish I had something to give, but... Uh, <laughs> Erland is here, uh, I knew uh, there will be an answer. So, yeah, a thousand. We are restricted to a thousand rows. It's internally algebraized using the same concept like a union all, essentially, and it is restricted to a thousand. Anyway, back to our situation. So with this in mind, if I take this computation and instead of using it here, I'll go and define it using my values clause and then I'll assign uh, the target column name as the external name for the column uh, in our table expression. Now, suddenly, the uh, alias that we just assigned, because it wasn't assigned in the select, it was assigned in the from, is naturally visible to us throughout the query. And therefore, I can now go and do a where order year greater than, you know, 
uh, let's say 2007, never mind Erland, that is not a search argument. I'm now showing it for not optimization-related reasons, but rather more for syntactical reasons. So you see it works no problem. Uh, and what is interesting from an optimization perspective, besides the fact that I'm filtering by an expression, which is not a good idea, but other than that, uh, the optimizer, before it gets involved, the parser already does some magic, a uh, kind of unnesting the logic within those table expressions. So when you look at the query plan, you do not see that there's any, somehow, a loop, you know, that goes and iterates for the different rows in the table and then goes activate some extra work. No, the logic gets unnested and it's actually evaluated as part of the scanning of the data. So it doesn't really cost us anything, the fact that we went and did this sort of apply. It's only a logical tool and certainly uh, more elegant than the use of those CTEs on top of CTEs. Furthermore, if we wanted to now build a computation based on another computation due to this set treatment and all at once concept, we couldn't do this in the same phase, but nothing then prevents us from using another cross apply and then having a second kind of a derived table that goes and defines another computation that let's say takes what the previous apply created is now visible to us and then do any further computations. And let's say we wanted to call this next year, you know, or something like this. And now I could go and refer here maybe to next year, no problem. Again, anywhere that I like within my uh, query, right? So that's one of the nice use cases where we need to build computations based on computations. We don't want to pay anything extra for this, but we certainly don't want to keep defining cities on top of cities and so on, right? So that's our first uh, use case. Uh, any questions, by the way, you feel free to stop me at any point. Any questions about the fundamentals of apply or this use case before we move on to the next kind of creative use case? All right, so our next use case is a kind of classic uh, problem in SQL. Uh, you know, kinds of patterns, both in terms of, uh, let's say, types of tasks or problems, in terms of physical structures and so on, that keep repeating themselves, people tend to name, so uh, they can more easily communicate about them, you know, like anything else in life. So there's a very classic uh, need that repeats itself in uh, kind of realistic scenarios in many, many different forms. It's known generally as the top n pair group kind of uh, task. What it means in essence is that I need to filter a certain top number of rows. In most cases, the n is one, by the way, but it could be a different number greater than one based on some order. So in top n per group tasks, we have usually uh, three elements involved. There's the group, or I will refer to it as the partitioning element. So for example, if I want to return the three most recent orders for each customer, the partitioning element is the customer, the for each part. Uh, give me the latest price for each security, the security will be our partitioning element, right? So let's just mark in our case, customer ID as being the partitioning element. Then the second part in top n per group tasks is the ordering element. So um, what is the ordering element when I say give me the three most recent orders for each customer? It's actually a combination of ordering elements. All the day descending is the first, right? Day descending is the first thing that tells us what's most recent. But then if we have multiple rows with the same date, I need some sort of a tiebreaker. Maybe I'm using the primary key value as my tiebreaker. So let's mark order date descending followed by order ID descending as our tiebreaker, okay? And then the last part in any top n per group is, so what do we want to return in the result based on these partitioning and ordering elements, right? So if in my uh, query I need to return the customer ID, the order date and order ID, which are anyway part of these elements, plus maybe also employee ID is what I need to return from those orders. Then let's call the third element covered uh, elements, or covering maybe, we'll use similar terminology like the others, 
Uh, so in addition to what we already use as partitioning and ordering that will naturally want to return from the query, whatever else you need to return from the query will be your third part. All right? So these are the elements in our task. Now, the question is, uh, one, uh, what is the query that will give us good performance for this kind of uh, task? And two, what kind of physical structures, if any, we could create to support such queries if they are very frequent in our system, right? So, starting with the physical structures, there are quite a few different solutions out there that people use for top end per groups, but there's one indexing pattern that works beautifully for all of the solutions. And because it's a very repeating pattern, uh, I, I, for myself, just for me to be able to more easily remember it, and also when I talk to people, I, I try to explain it so that I can later communicate about it, I call this pattern POC, which is just an acronym for partitioning, ordering elements, or partitioning, ordering, and covering elements, and that's the way you want to define your index. So in our problem, the optimal index would be Let's name it uh, just IDX POC so we can easily see it in the plan. Uh, let me just make sure that I don't have one already. So drop index on orders. All right. So let's go ahead and create such an index. Uh, now, the first two elements are what you want in the key list. The remaining elements is what you want in the include list in order to avoid lookups, you know, so we can find everything we need within that covering index. So we create the index on the, the partitioning and ordering elements as the key elements in this order. And then uh, we include all remaining elements if we want the index to be a covering one, right? So quite straightforward, as you can see. Let's go ahead and create it, right? By the way, my friend uh, Adam Mechanic uh, took this acronym and tried it on an audience. He gave a lecture somewhere and he said they just couldn't uh, remember it easily. So uh, he tried adding the O part from the covering and he called it a POCO. And he said it caught much better. So and whatever works for you. I, I find the POC nice, but then again, it's a very typical acronym that is used for a bunch of other things, so maybe POCO is better. So whatever works. So anyway, now that we have the POC index in place, let's talk about solutions. There's one typical solution that does work well, but only in some cases, like many solutions. So, you know, it's so common in query tuning that uh, people come up with a solution, it works very well, but they don't realize it works well because of certain conditions and then they make it a rule of thumb, and then use it you know, everywhere, and then in some other scenarios, it just doesn't work very well anymore. So uh, depending very much on the most critical thing, the density of the partitioning element, the density is you know, uh, how many distinct cases do we have, basically. So if I have a situation where I'm doing this calculation per a customer and I have, let's say, just let's play with numbers so that we have a sense. I have, let's start with a scenario where we have very low density. Low density means we have lots of distinct values, each appearing a very small number of times, right? So let's say that we have in total 10 million rows and for a low density example, we have, a, let's say, a million customers each appearing in average, let's say, 10 times. So we have 10 orders per customer. In terms of number of pages in our POC index, the rows are pretty short. As you can see, we have four columns, and they are not very wide. We have a date time, we have an integer, an integer, an integer, you know, pretty short. We uh, fit, uh, we have, I would say, something like 20 something bytes per row, so we have roughly 300 rows, let's say, per page. Okay? Now you do the math, 10 million rows, about 300 per page, we're looking at about 30,000 pages in the leaf of our POC index. So let's try to visualize it for a moment. I'll use one of my favorite tools. Uh, so looking at the structure, it should look something like this. This is our 
uh, B tree. And then for a low density case, we have lots, lots and lots of uh, uh, sections, each for a different customer, right? So we have uh, one range for customer one, another range for customer two, another range for customer three. And like this, we have a million sections. And within each section, the data is then sorted by they descending or already descending, right? So here is customer one, here is customer two, here is customer three, and so on. Now, certainly in a low density case where we have to remind you 30,000 pages, all right? Let's increase a bit the font, it will be easier for you to see. So we have 30,000 pages in the leaf of the index. Certainly, the kind of plan that we do not want to see is a plan that does a seek per a partition, per customer, right? Why? Because with a million customers, this will happen a million times. And then each seek will cost us, with 10 million rows, we're looking at probably three levels in the tree. Uh, one million times three, that's three million random reads. So let's just mark that with the low density case, if we get a solution that does six, we will get about three million random reads. Not good, simply not good. Certainly compared to the potential, which here with one scan will give us 30,000 sequential reads. So we know what kind of plan we don't want to see. This is the kind of plan that does a seek, and then a scan of three rows, and then another seek, and then a scan of three rows. That's what we don't want to see. What kind of plan do we want to see? This kind of plan, you know, the plan that does a scan. And what is the tool that will give us this kind of, uh, this kind of plan? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. So I'm sorry I misled you a bit, but uh, not apply. Soon we will talk about when apply will get into the picture. Any clue which tool that can help us solve the problem will give us this kind of plan that does one ordered scan within the index. I'm afraid top doesn't have a sort of partitioning element. It would have been great, actually, now that you're saying, uh, if we had some kind of a top that says uh, top and then somehow a uh, three, but with the ability to say partition by, you know, the customer ID. If we had such a, what? An overclose. Yeah, an overclose, exactly. Or not, you know, it could be over, it could be not over, but at least that we can specify kind of a partition element, but we don't have this, right? So any clue about any other tool that can give us this sort of behavior? Row number. So what we will do is we will have our query return all those elements, of course, customer ID, order date, order ID, and employee ID from our table. And then what we will do is we will add a row number computation that is partitioned by the partitioning element naturally and ordered by, this is very explicit here, the ordering element. And we get those row, rows marked with their position. So uh, let's call it row num. We get those rows marked with their positions. And you can see in the query plan how we're getting a nice ordered scan. You can see this, an ordered scan of our POC index. And those row numbers are computed and you can see how the computation of the row numbers is almost negligible in the cost when we already have the data in the right order within our index. So the cost, 99% of the cost, is 30,000 reads. Now one piece left is going and defining a table expression with, a, a, in this case, a CTE, and then having the filtering taking place against the, the CTE in the outer query, so from C, where, and now we say the row num is great, or sorry, less than or equal to three, and now we get our three most recent orders for each customer with one additional component in the plan, and as you can see, just a filter. So the very same plan like before, but now the filter goes and returns only the interesting information. All right, so now that we have a solution that gives us the exact plan and the exact performance that we know that is good for a low density, we have a problem if we have high density in the data. Why? Because even if we have high density, like if we did this for each shipper, 
uh, we have only 10 shippers in the system, each with a million orders, uh, using this solution, uh, doesn't matter if we have low density or high density, we get the very same plan. But the potential with a high density case is to do 10 six, as opposed to now the 30,000 reads that we are doing. And with 10 six, we should get it done with about 30 reads. And now the question is, which tool will give us the solution? Apply, and when will we see it? After the break. All right, so uh, we have uh, how many minutes? 20? We take 20 minutes break. 20 minutes break? Yeah. When we come back, the first thing we see is how we use apply to get the plan that does those six and doing it in 30 reads, right? So see you soon. Thank you.